the power of the blood. Whoa, whoa. We're going to continue worshiping the Lord in song. Um, we're going to take also the opportunity to worship the Lord through our giving. And I want to share this just real quick. Um, when we give in church, um, there's a principle there that God is honoring when, when we're obedient in that way. And here's Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And he's writing to uh, the, the church in Corinth, and he's talking about a uh, gift that they're going to give to help meet the needs of other believers and, and give to the church. And he says this, and this is so, I think this is so powerful. The person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the person who sows generously will also reap generously. Each person should do as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or, or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful, cheerful giver. And, and here's the part I want to, to focus on because we read those first parts a lot of times and, and those are great. But here's what Paul adds on to that. And see, he says to the people, God is able to make every grace, and he's tying this into our obedience through giving, God is able to make every grace overflow to you so that in every way, always having everything you need, you may excel in every good work as it is written, he scattered, he gave to the poor, his righteous endures forever. Now the one who provides seed for the sower and bread for food will also provide and multiply your seed and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way, and here's why, for all generosity. We give so that God can bless, so that we can be generous, and we can help meet the needs of other people. So that you in increase the harvest of your righteousness, you will be enriched in every way for all genera generosity, which produces thanksgiving to God through us. So we're going we're to continue singing and worshiping. The ushers are coming, and, and uh, Lord, we just ask that as we do give, that the Lord, as we give from a, a willing heart and a cheerful heart, that you would take it, you would bless it for your glory and for your honor, and for us to, to, to be blessed by you so that we can continue to be generous to other people and to help meet the needs of people. We love you and give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.
serve a great God, he is great. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness. You give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you. us with our that breath that is in us let's just give god praise right now let's 
and give God praise. No, we don't need the music. Let's just with our voices. Let's just give God praise for his goodness, for his grace, for who he is. Lord, we give you praise and glory and honor. You deserve every bit of our praise. God, we lift up our voices to you. Lord, we lift up our hearts to you, God. Lord, forgive us of our sin. Forgive us, God, of falling short of who you called us to be. And Lord, raise us up to be all that you desire for us. Lord, raise us up to be all that you called us to be. Lord, we worship you because you deserve it. You are worthy. Lord, you are worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, I praise your holy name. Lord, we praise your holy name. Hallelujah, Lord. Lord Jesus, we give you praise. Amen. 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 Um, we're going to have our kids be dismissed in a minute. We're going to pray over them. And I just want to say this. I know the last, uh, I don't know how many weeks it's been now. Um, I've been going off and on, but I know they've had the kids in here doing praise and worship and then going back to, to kids' church. And I, just, I think that's huge because there's something incredible about your children seeing you worship God. Yeah. And being a part of that with you. And they're, they may not be at a stage that you're at with that, but for them to see that and experience so that, that impacts their lives and that has a lasting impact on them. And so, um, so man, just I, I'm glad we get to do that. Lord, we pray for every one of the children that are part of these families in this, this church. God, I pray that for those that are here this morning as they, as they go, as they go into, back into uh, kids' church and, and experiences your word through some some applications that are at you know, their age levels. Lord, I pray that you would continue just to speak to their hearts and their lives, that, Lord, you would raise them up to be used by you, Lord, to be um, warriors for you, God. And they would know you, and they would love you, and they would make you known. We bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Kiddos, you can uh, go back, follow Mr. Jeremy, Ms. Mary Lou to Kids Church. You guys are awesome. Thank you, praise team, for... Uh, for all your work and all you do with, uh, with leading up here week in and week out, different ones of you, um, very much appreciated. Uh, we're going to do this. Some of you may not have met each other before, so I know you sat down, I know up, down, I hate that, I don't. Um, go find two people you have not met before, maybe you've not talked to in a while. Go introduce yourself real quick, and, um, and then Chris is going to be coming up with, with some announcements. So everybody real quick, go find at least two people. At least two people you do not know or you've not met before or maybe you've not seen in a long time. You introduce yourself. There should not be one person that does not meet somebody new right now. Good morning, Legacy. <clears throat> Good morning, Legacy. How are we doing today? All right, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Come on. All right, so some upcoming events. Levi's will not meet today. Um, and ladies of Legacy, you're going to meet here at the church on Tuesday night, uh, September 27th at 7 p.m. Um, or you can come at 6.30 for snacks and to help set up. Um, we're also, uh, ladies are going to pray at, um, on Wednesday morning at 9.30 at Sophia's house. And, uh, you, you all are invited to join us for worship and warfare this Friday night, September 30th at 7.30 p.m. right here. Um, and also if you're new to the faith in Christ and new to Legacy Church, we'd like to invite you to our growth track. And that's going to begin next Sunday, October 2nd at 6 p.m. And, um. We have three outreach opportunities in October, um, the Fall Festival, the 
Light the Night and Friends and Family event. So please check these out on our events on our website and sign up to help. Thank you. I think Pastor had a video. Whether you're new to our church or you've been coming for a while, Growth Track events are designed to kickstart your spiritual growth by providing clear and simple on ramps that will challenge you to go farther, faster in your faith. These events happen each month and cover a wide range of topics that include how to become a member of our church learning the basics of our Christian faith, discovering your spiritual gifts, and more. Visit our website for more information about other upcoming Growth Track events. Okay. Whether you're new to our church or you've been coming for a while, okay, Growth so Track events are designed. All right. Um, just a couple things uh, to add to what Christian said on the announcements. Uh, the, uh, go, do go online and check those out. The outreaches that are coming up uh, if you do not have if you do not get the emails from miss debbie that she sends out with upcoming events and stuff like that make sure whether you're new or not grab one of these in the in the foyer before you leave and put your email address on there and your contact information and she emails all that kind of information out so you have that uh, we don't want to just rely on announcements on sunday morning and also the stuff is on the website and then uh, uh, these cards are laying out there if you notice those or not, I kind of, you know, I kind of walk in, walk out, don't always notice everything that's out there, but um, if you want to take, you know, a couple of these and share them with the neighbor, just kind of give them a little bit of idea. If they don't have a church home, um, this kind of talks about a little bit about legacy, and you can take a few of those with you and, and pass those out if you want. Uh, we're going to be doing an outreach called Light the Night, and uh, we've got a couple of families that volunteer their homes this year, and um, what Light the Night is, it's basically flipping the switch on Halloween. Halloween is about spiritual darkness. I mean, that's what the, the, the thing is about. We, we make it a fun thing. We collect candy and that kind of stuff. But at its root, Halloween is about that. And so we've got a couple of families that volunteer their homes to do something that we're calling light the night. Basically, we're going to light up a night that's meant for darkness. And what's going to happen is uh, these two homes, we're going to have just literally lights so that it's visible when people are walking down the street and they're like, what is going on in the house up there? And at the house, they're going to have some games. They're going to have lots of candy they're giving out. We're going to have people from here that are going to go volunteer to be at those houses for a, a couple of hours. And you may help serve some, some food. You may help with a game. You may, you may just be there and just chit chat with people that come along and, and offer to pray with them. But it's going to be, it's going to be something where um, it doesn't take tons of stuff. It doesn't take tons of, uh, you don't have to have certain gifts and talents and abilities. You show up and, and you're there for about an hour and a half, two hours with people just, they're coming on their own. You don't have to put tons of flyers out because guess what? We picked a couple of neighborhoods that have lots of trick-or-treaters that come by. So you, you have a, a captive audience because they're always coming by. And here's what, here's what we saw happen in Missouri when we did this, when we pastored in Missouri. The first year, you know, people kind of like, well, what is this? And they were checking it out. But second year, third year, moving on, um, people would bring their kids and their families and they would just stay at those houses for two hours. And they, we said, you know, what do you, you guys stay here? You know, they're like, this is fun for our kids. It's safe. There's candy. They get plenty of candy, the same amount of candy they would get otherwise. And man, you guys just, the people from your church, just, I mean, you're praying with people and, and we had hot dogs too. They like that. But, uh, but, uh, but it just became a thing where people came and and they just loved the fact that we were being, showing the love of Christ in a practical way. And um, they connected with, with our church and who we were. And, and um, it just was a really, really neat experience. We're going to have some little giveaways uh, to, to give to the kids, uh, kind of thing that um, might bring them into kids' church. Uh, so you'll have more information coming out about that in the next couple of Sundays. And uh, so I would say get ready to be a part of that because it's really, really fun, uh, just speaking from experience. And also, we're going to have information next week for you to start looking at and sign up if you want to. We did a mission trip this year to Costa Rica, and it was a blast, and we saw God do some really cool things through that. And um, what we're going to do, talking to Pastor and Debbie, what they want to do is like alternate. So one year do international, next year do domestic, because we've got a lot of mission needs here in America, and then international and domestic. So next year, um, we're going to be partnering with an um, Indian reservation in New Mexico, that uh, there's a ministry there that ministers to the people there, and it's, it's a lot of need there. And um, 
Uh, we're going to be uh, taking a team. We're going to be driving our own vans to so a little road trip together and just have some fun. And uh, so we'll have some more information about that coming up um, next Sunday and some things you can take home to look at. And then one more thing. Um, yesterday, got to go to the Canopy of Prayer event, and they gave out these, uh, these little, uh, not really flyers, but these papers, and Emily could speak to this better than I could, but um, she's an integral part of that Canopy of Prayer event every year um, and just ongoing through the year. But this is, a, this is our, our Princeton community. And it shows on here the blue areas are current subdivisions in our community. The yellow ones are proposed or ones that are, are actually been started, but they're still coming. Let me read this to you. Uh, future single family units in Princeton, 17,767. Single family units. Total single family units currently and coming, 25,678. Future multifamily units, 5,102. Those are like apartment complexes, like next door right here. Total, family, total multifamily units, 6,624. Now, you can do whatever math you want with that. I'm just going to go with the single family units, 25,678. The average number you know, across America, the average number of people in a home is like 2.8 or something like that. So let's say three. Uh, that's 75,000 people at least. That's not counting the multifamily units. Now, it's a couple of things. One, a lot of people are here and a lot of people are coming. Uh, that's just the reality of it. We have a lot of opportunity to share the love of Jesus with people and, and, and be, be Christ to this community. Two, they gave these out, and on the back, they've got them all numbered, all the subdivisions. So yours is on there probably, unless you live way out. Um, and they have on the back the name of the, of the uh, subdivision that's either there or coming in, and what they did was they said, take one of these for your family. And when you drive around this community, check this out. When you go to a subdivision, see which one it is, and pray for it just while you're driving through. Or maybe you live in one of them. Walk around your neighborhood, take a walk, and just pray for your neighborhood. So um, we have some of those laying in the back as you leave. You want to take one for your family to have, keep it in the car. When you drive around Princeton, that kind of thing, you've got a, uh, easy access and, and you can remember real easily. But I wanted to make you aware of that. And if we run out, I think Miss Emily can probably get some more of those. So that sound good, Miss Emily? All right. So I got a hat here. If you like to golf or go outside, you, know, you like to cover your head up. Um, it doesn't fit my head, but I've got a hat here and it's got a $20 bill attached to it right there. Um, a real one. It's not Monopoly money. Um, how many of you would be interested in this hat? Just based off of that right there. Okay, so the younger people, just because they got a little money attached, okay, about seven, six, seven, eight of you. Nobody else is interested. Well, what if I told you that if you, if you were willing to receive this hat, there's also something else that's a part of the hat, and it is a credit card with a $30,000 um, credit line on it that there's zero balance, and you can spend that $30,000 and not have to pay it back. Now, how many of you would like that hat? Almost every hand's going up. <laughs> you're not really getting it because it's my card, but you're, <laughs> and it doesn't have that much limit on it. But, um, but just imagine, almost every hand went up when you understood there was more to the hat than what, what you thought in the beginning. My hope is that as I share with you this morning, oh, let's put that back up there. My hope is, maybe I should put it in my wallet. My hope is as I share with you this morning, um, and I hope, I hope this is my prayer and hope for me, like just when I read the word of God that when I understand all more of what comes with it, that it's something I want even more in my life. And so I'm, I'm going to share with you this morning and uh, uh, hopefully that's what happens. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, just come together and worship you, Lord. I thank you, God, that um, you've called us to know you and to make you known. Uh, real simple. To know you, have a relationship with you, and to make you known to people all around us. Lord, help us to do that more effectively. Help us to do that um, more powerfully with demonstrations of your power and your Holy Spirit in our lives, Lord. I love you. I pray that you just bless uh, your word this morning and use it to continue to, to strengthen our lives. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to read a scripture verse to you to start with. Um, it's from Hebrews chapter 11. If you're familiar at all with Hebrews 11, if you're not, I'm going to tell you, 
Hebrews 11 is a part of the Bible where the writer of Hebrews, um, something it's Paul, something it's Apollos, but the writer of Hebrews is, he's given an account of just some of the great people of faith throughout history. Um, we would call them people of faith throughout the Bible because we know them in there. But he's given an account of those people, and he talks about all these people of faith and the things that they did and the things they saw God do and, and the things that, that God, man, just did incredible, miraculous things and did all this stuff where, where God just showed up in a powerful way and, and just did amazing things from, from people, um, people being healed, people being raised up, people, the, the, I mean, the sun standing still for, for Joshua and his armies, I mean, just all kinds of things. But then we come to this one verse in here, and you read it, and you're kind of like, what's the big deal of what's going on there? And it's Hebrews chapter 11, and it's verse 21, and it says, and I think we're going to have it up. Yes, by faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, and he worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. So you got people that are being raised from the dead, you got people that are defeating armies, all this stuff in Hebrews 11, and then, then you've got this with Jacob, he blessed Joseph's sons basically and worshipped leaning on his staff. Now it's one of those verses that for me, when, just to read over that, I just go on to the next one, okay, he was leaning on his staff, if you go back to the Old Testament where that story happens, he's old, his vision is, is, is very dim, and, and he gets, sits up on the side of his bed, and Joseph brings his sons to him, and, and he reaches out and blesses them, and does all of that, and, and for me, I, I just always thought the staff, well, they carried staffs around because they walked a lot of places. They were tired, they, they needed help walking along, especially as you got older, and all that kind of stuff. But I heard someone preach a message this summer that totally opened my eyes to something beyond that with the whole idea of the staff. And I'm going to share that with you, and yes, I heard this from somebody else. Um, uh, Solomon says there's nothing new under the sun, and there's not. Um, but this is a message, this, this, this concept is something I heard this summer, and I, I want to share this with you so that you understand this and have this, because I think it's so powerful. There was a man named Carl Brett that he wrote an article about three years ago, and he talked about just some things that God was using him and, and giving him opportunities to do, and he shares about an occasion when he was in Israel. And he says, one time while visiting Israel, I went to a museum and saw a small brass buck, like a deer brass buck in the corner, with several wooden poles, intricately marked with symbols from the bottom to the top. So I asked the curator what they were, and with broken English, he said, rods of testimony. He signaled for another member of staff to come who could explain. What they shared between them brought a significant revelation of Scripture into my own life. Listen to this, because this is so amazing. We're going to look at some different examples of this in the, in the Scriptures. They shared that as a child came to the age of understanding, they would be given a clean shaft of wood. Found me a clean shaft of wood at Bucky's yesterday. <laughs> but they didn't have Bucky's back then. They would be given a clean shaft of wood. For them, it was about a meter long, about three feet. I'm a little taller, so I got a longer one. And a knife. They would be given a knife with the shaft. And the idea being that as they had significant encounters of God, they would carve a symbol or sign into the wood from the bottom to the top. I was faced with a spiritual diary and looking at those staffs, this is Carl Brett Brettle saying this, I was faced with the spiritual diary of some folks that were already long and dead. Each symbol on those staffs that he was looking at representing something significant in those people's lives. So now when we look at that verse that was up here, it takes on a whole other meaning. Jacob, Joseph shows up with his sons. Jacob is about to pray over them and bless them and prophesy over them. And he sits up, old in age, toward the end of his life, here on this earth. And he leans on his staff before he does any of that. And in that staff, this man that's almost blind... I can imagine him feeling all those notches on his staff. For he's about to pray over and bless 
those grandsons of his that he, he thought he never would, he didn't know he had them. He thought he had lost his son, Joseph. And just feeling those notches and those different things as he's about to bless and pass on to the next generation what God has for them. He's remembering all that God's done for him. I can imagine him thinking about the time that he wrestled with the angel of the Lord until he received the blessing from the Lord. I can imagine him thinking about just all the different times that, that God provided, that God came through, that God did what he did in his life. And him remembering all those things as he got ready to, to pass on his blessing to, to Joseph's sons. I can imagine, I'll tell you about another one. I'll tell you, imagine this guy named David. He's a young man, maybe 12, 13, 14 years old, and his brothers are part of the army of Israel. And there's, he, his dad sends him to take food to his brothers. And there's this big giant that keeps coming out every day. And he's the warrior of the Philistines. And he keeps coming out every day and saying to the armies of Israel, send me your best warrior. Let him fight me. If he beats me, Israel is victorious. If I win, the Philistines are victorious and the Israelites become our slaves. The Bible says that day after day after day, he would come out and issue his challenge. And day after day after day, there was no Israelite soldier that would step up to the challenge until one day. David, young man, there to take food, he hears the giant saying what he's saying, and he hears the men start talking, and he says to them, what is, what's this guy, what's this all about? And they said, hey, here's what's going on, this guy keeps coming out, and, and he's a great warrior, there's none of us that have been able to have the courage to, to go after him, in fact, the king has even offered, if, we'll, if somebody will do it and win, I'll give you my daughter in marriage. I'll, I'll bless your household. You will have riches untold. I mean, the king's offering all kinds of stuff. You kind of wonder why isn't the king going out there. But, but he's offering all this stuff, and David's like, really? Well, his brothers catch wind that he's asking about it, and his brothers are like, dude, you're always trying to get into something. Your ego and your pride, man, you just think you're all that. You think because Samuel anointed you future king that you got it all going on? And David's like, all I did was ask. So he says he turns to some other men and he says, tell me again, what's, what's the deal here? And they tell him, and, and he's like, you know, why are we allowing this uncircumcised, unclean Philistine coming out to do this every single day and, and we're not willing to trust God to go against him in battle? He says, I'll do it. Now, was there some cockiness in there? Well, I, we don't know, but his brothers thought so. He's like, I'll do it. So the men, they take, they take word to King Saul, and we, they go, hey, we got this, this pipsqueak out here that he's saying he can take this guy home. And Saul says, okay, send him here. So he sends for him, and David explains to him, um, I, I'm not afraid. Because you see, I cared for my father's sheep. And there was a bear that came and took one of the sheep, and I chased the bear down, and I rescued the sheep out of his mouth. And when the bear tried to turn on me, I grabbed him, and I struck him down, and I killed him through the power of God in my life. And King, there was this lion that came and grabbed one of the sheep, and I chased the lion down, and I, I rescued the sheep from his jaws. And when the lion turned on me, I struck the lion down, and I killed him. And just like God enabled me to strike down the bear and strike down, strike down the lion just to sh save one of our sheep, he's going to give me the same strength to go against this uncircumcised Philistine, and I'm going to be able to strike him down too because of who God is in my life. So Saul goes, okay, little man, here's what we're going to do. 1 Samuel 17, 38 to 40 says this. Then Saul had his own military clothes put on David. 
He put a bronze helmet on David's head and had him put on armor. David strapped his sword on over the military clothes and tried to walk, but he was not used to them. I can't walk in these, David said to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off. Before I read the last couple of sentences, I want to say this. God has called each and every single one of us into different things in our lives. And what he directs me to do, it may look similar to somebody else out here, but most of the time, he's called me to something. He's going to direct you to certain things in your life. And when we try to put on someone else's anointing on us versus walking in the anointing that God has planted on us, we may have some success here or there because there's whatever, but it's not going to be all that God has called us to be, and it's going to feel clumsy at times. It's not going to feel right at times. And so I want to encourage you, if we're, what God's called you to, when I say called you to, first of all, he's called you to know him. And that's the common thing that we all have. He's called us to know him and walk in relationship with him. And he's called us, he'll, throughout your life, he will guide and direct and lead. And he puts things in your heart and your life that he wants you to do, he wants you to be. And you need to do it in a way that he's asked you to do it. And go after that and not just try to, not try to do it with someone else's anointing. So David says, says he took him off. And now here's the part I would have just overread until, I just, I'm sorry, would have read over until uh, this last summer when I heard this pastor share this. It said, instead, he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the wadi, from the creek, and put them in a pouch in his shepherd's bag. Then with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. See, when I read that, I see the stones, and I see the sling, the weapons. Because I, I know the story is he uses those weapons to bring the giant down through the power of the Holy Spirit, empowering him to do that. And I read over this one part, and I think it's the part that's so crucial for us to understand, and it's this. It says that, it doesn't say that David went first and grabbed the stones. It says David took the clothing off, and instead he took his staff in his hand. And when we understand now what the staff was used for, that from the time he was a young boy, he had been carving things in his staff to remind him of God's goodness, to remind him of God's provision, to remind him of which God saved him from the lion and the bear and saved his sheep, to remind him of the time that Saul showed up and tried to find one of the sons of Jesse to anoint to be king, and none of the older brothers were it. And so Jesse brings David in, not thinking David is him at all. And Samuel says, God says to Samuel, this is the one, anoint him. And I know David at some point put another, some kind of notch or something in his, in his staff to let him know that God's rescued me, God's called me, and God's going to use me. And so the first thing he grabs when he's taken all that armor off, off, that Saul's to put on him. He takes all it all. He doesn't go grab the weapons first. He grabs the thing that reminds him of who God is, of what God's done in his life, of where he's come from, and that God's going to be faithful to do whatever he needs to do in his life and situation. And that's exciting. Think about Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. Now I'm reading from the Holman Christian Standard Bible, so if you memorize it in King James, it'll sound a little awkward to you. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I lack. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even when I go through the darkest valley, King James says the shadow of death, when I go through the darkest valleys, I fear no danger, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now the rod, and those words can be used interchangeably, but the rod typically was what was used as more of a weapon to chase off the, the certain animals and, and, and also to guide and correct the sheep and that kind of stuff and keep them going in the direction they should. And the staff could be used for that too, but the staff, we understand what it was used for. That the, that person, David, who's writing Psalms 23 when he says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Why is the staff comforting David? Because now at an old age, when he's writing this, what we call Psalm 23, man, he looks at that staff when he's going through the valley of the shadow of death. And he's reflecting, he's, he's remembering 
when God not only delivered him from the lion and the bear and anointed him through, with, through Saul, but now he's remembering in his old age where, where God saved him from, uh, anointed him through Samuel, where God saved him from Saul when Saul was jealous and Saul was trying to kill him. He was reminded of the times where, where he, he attacked, the, he, had fought, he had fights and battles with the Philistines and different, different groups of people that would come against them, and, and, and God gave them victory. He's remembering where, where he failed miserably. He was out on the top of his, of, of his, of his, uh, of his castle, not his castle, of, his, uh, of where he lived, what's that called? <laughs> not castle, they have castle back but outside of his his houses and stuff, and, and he's at the, his palace. There we go, his palace, and he's looking out, and he sees he sees this woman bathing on the top of her, the roof of her house, which they did. That was common, but he sees her, and he's like, I want her. And he calls for her, and he has sexual relationship with her, and she gets pregnant. So he calls for his her husband, who is one of the leaders in his army, to come and, and be with her so that he can cover up his sin and the guy wouldn't because he was so faithful to David. He said, I will not give myself pleasure when the rest of your men are out fighting and I will sleep on the doorstep of my house until I return to the battlefield. And so David realizes he can't cover his sins, so he sends him out back to the battlefield and puts him on the front line hoping that he would die, and he did die. So he calls for Bathsheba to marry her so that hopefully he can cover his sin up. And then one day he's confronted, he's confronted by the prophet and the prophet confronts his sin. And David repents. You can read Saul in Psalms, his psalm of repentance. And it's this cry out to God. God, please do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Lord, please do not allow my, what I did, do not allow that to separate me from you. And I'm sure he's looking at that rod, remembering that time where, you know, he failed miserably. God confronted and exposed his sin, but then God in his grace and his mercy, even though there were consequences that came with it, he lost his firstborn son. He, things happened because of his sin. There was Death always comes out of sin, but he can, he can look back and see where, where God spared his life and God, God gave him grace in that moment and in that situation. He can look at the sons that God blessed him with. He can look at all the things that, that God did for him in his time of serving him. And when he says, when I'm going through the valley of the shadow of death, then your staff, it comforts me because I've seen you work in my life so many times. And no matter what this valley brings, you're there and you're walking with me and you're going to do what you know needs to be done in that situation. Can you imagine Moses? Moses and the Israelites have fled from Egypt. Pharaoh's heart's hardened. And Pharaoh calls his army together, and his generals, and they take off after Israel. And God, God's guided Israel to this place where the Dead Sea is in front of them. The Red Sea is in front of them. Not the Dead Sea. The Red Sea is in front of them. And the army's behind them, and they're trapped. And the people cry out to Moses and like, did you just bring us out here so we could all be buried in one place out here? We told you, leave us alone. We'll stay in Egypt and, and we'll just be their, 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 their servants and their slaves. At least we weren't dying. And God says to Moses, Moses, stretch out your rod in your hand toward the water when I give you the order to do that. And when you do, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to split the waters. I'm going to split the waters and you and your people are going to walk across on dry land, but the, Isra but the Egyptians will not have the same fortune. Because today I will make it known that I am God. I am the one true God and that army will be wiped out and you will see my hand of deliverance. You can imagine Moses lifting up that rod and as he lifts it up, he, he sees, he's reminded again of what God has done in his life, the burning bush speaking to him there, the, the story that his mother told him of how she placed him in a basket and saved his life when he was a baby, the stories of how God provided all through his life, how God called him, how the stories, the, the markings from each time God would say, stretch out your staff and a plague would happen to the Egyptians, how those are all on here and, and he's seeing all that God's done 
And here's the cool thing is, when he stretched out, stretches out his hand with his staff, see, in front of them, they had a dire situation. In front of them, they had the thing that was going to keep them from moving forward in what God had called them to in their promised land. In front of them, they had something that looked like there was no hope. But when he stretches out his staff, while the situation's still there, there's something now that's between the problem and me and him, Moses in that situation. It's remembering who his God is. So now the problem doesn't look quite as bad because I see all that God's done and I'm reminded and I know that God's got my back and I know that God's going before me and I know that even though that problem's still there, this is my focus, not the staff itself, but who God is. And no matter what that looks like, my God's going to show up, and my God's going to be real. And so today, if we had a staff like this and it was empty, maybe we would could sit around for a long time and just make little marks and knots. And we'll start at the top just because it's easier. <laughs> maybe we have notches that, that we would make, and maybe for me it would be a story of when I was in my mama's womb and her cord was, and I don't remember the story because I was a baby, but she's told it to me dozens of times over the years, her and my dad did, because um, I'd always ask him again to make sure I was getting it right and not telling the story wrong. But I was in her womb, and the cord was wrapped around my throat so tight that they thought it was going to strangle me and kill me. And um, she was ready to deliver me, and the nurses were in the, house, in the delivery room, and our doctor was running late. And uh, the nurse called the doctor, Dr. Caprol, and said, what do you want me to do? Because I'm afraid he'll, he'll die if we just deliver him normal. And he said, just, that's the only thing we can do is just go ahead and start the delivery like normal. And according to my mom and dad, a doctor walked in that they did not know, they'd never seen before. And as I was ready to come out, he turned me just enough to loosen the cord enough so that I wouldn't strangle to death. I still had to go into a breathing tent and stuff like that, uh, have some oxygen and stuff. But God saved my life. And that doctor left, and they never got a bill from him. They never knew who he was. And they never saw him. They never saw him again. So that, that might be one of the things that I put on my staff, or it might be the time that when I was a junior in high school, and um, I broke up with this girl I'd been dating, and um, uh, I began to pray and take that part of my life more seriously just pray and ask God I said Lord I pray that you would bring a lady into my life that I can spend the rest of my life with and your will for my life be accomplished and that we can serve you together and any other person that comes along that doesn't fit that then don't let anything come of that relationship and for the next two years of my life until I went to college dated several girls and every single time it became a thing of, you know, let's just be friends because this isn't going to be something that's forever. And um, either it was me saying it or her saying it, and, and that continued to happen. And then there was this one girl that I really liked before I went off to college, and, and, um, and it wasn't, but it wasn't someone that I should spend the rest of my life with. And my mom talked to me one day, and she said, Scott, you're willing to give up everything you feel God's called you to for a girl as much as... I know you like her, but it's not what God's called you to. You need to pursue what you know God's called you to, and because you shouldn't give it up. And I knew she was right. And I, you know, you know, I talked to the girl about it, and obviously her tears and cried and all that kind of stuff. But then I continued to pray that prayer. And my freshman year of college, about a month or so in, I see this girl in the second floor lobby of the hall we lived in, and um, I thought, I want to, I want to meet her. And her name was Lori. And um, long story short, I got to meet her, and uh, we went out just for fun and, and with groups of people and, and continued to pray that prayer that I was praying the whole time I dated her and continued to, things continued to move forward and get, you know, just that relationship. And she sent me a, she gave me a card one day or a letter, and in the letter it said, here's what I've been praying. And it was almost the exact thing I've been praying for the last two years. And, and uh and God blessed me with, with Lori. And we've been married 31 years, and, and, and it's incredible. You know, I might, I, I might, put, I might put on here that, um, that um, you know, we're driving home from, we're driving to Ohio one day from, some of you heard the story of, 
to surprise my dad for his birthday after our uh, fourth year in college, Lori had graduated, I had one year left, and we were in a bad car accident about 18 miles from their house, and um, we both almost died, and Lori lost her right eye, and her face was shattered, and my leg, they were gonna, my leg was going to be amputated, and anyhow, long story short, God took a tragedy and turned it into something that was for his glory. Maybe I have in here, you know, maybe I scrape on here where, you know, God blesses us, you know, with our two children, and and um, just all that we went through with them. Maybe I have on here where, where my daughter is a, in, toward the end of her sophomore year. Um, I had to, as the dean of students at the school, I had to remove my own daughter from the school because of some decisions she made uh, that were very, that were very uh, hard for her as far as what she went through the next couple of years. And, um, but we've seen God just bring her out of that. And she's, she's awesome. She gave us our first grandson. She loves the Lord. And, and um, she just told me the other day, she's like, God, not God, she didn't call me God. She's like, Dad, <laughs> that we were down there this last Sunday through Wednesday uh, visiting. We say we visit her, but we were really there to visit Tommy. Uh, but she, I asked her, I said, how are you and Jacob doing? Jacob's her husband. Jacob wasn't raised in a Christian home. They went to church like twice a, a year, but um, Christmas and Easter, but he gave his heart to the Lord before they got married, and, and uh, he's a newer Christian, and and um, I said, how are you guys doing? How's he doing? He's a firefighter, so he works two, 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 two straight days. He's on 48, off 96. So depending on where that shift's at, he may go two, three weeks in a row where he doesn't get to go to church together with him on Sundays because of that. So I was asking her how he's doing, and she said, Dad, what's really neat is, she said, he, he's, he's, he's been, he, just how he's grown has been great. She said, and here's what's really cool is, you know, tithing and giving, that's never been a part of his life. And Dad, we, we committed to doing that. And uh, it's been neat because he's seen God provide for us in ways that he wouldn't, we wouldn't have seen otherwise, and he's seen how God's faithful in that. And uh, so that was really cool to hear him say that. Uh, and so I could go through story after story. You could stand up here and take a staff and go story after story after story. And while today, in today's world, we don't have staffs that we mark, uh, usually we use social media and cameras and stuff like that, but, but um, every single one of us can have stories of God's goodness and God's faithfulness. And I would ask us this morning, and we're going to, uh, we're going to just spend a little bit of time praying here a little bit. Um, and I think, Ms. Jaden, if you're okay with you guys, we will do that song. Just play through that song, the, the last one that you did, because uh, we'll, I, I think that's fitting for, for what we're, we're talking about. But we all can have... We all can have those stories of God's faithfulness and God's goodness in our lives. And sometimes it's prayers that don't go answered the way we want them to. But maybe down the road we see how God worked in the midst of it in a different way than what we thought was best. And there will be some things that, just to be honest, that we may not know the side of heaven, how God totally used it. And it didn't look totally like how we wanted to. But one day when we stand before him and he shows us all that he did through our lives. And we see it from his point of view and from his side of things. We'll rejoice because God's viewpoint wasn't temporal, but it was eternal. And so here's what we're going to do. If the praise team can come back up here, let's do this. And we, I'm in an early, so we've got some time uh, to do this. I want to ask you this. Three questions. Maybe you're here and you're facing a challenge right now. Maybe you're facing a Red Sea, or maybe you're facing a giant, or maybe you're just facing a situation that, you know what, uh, it's, it's, it's a situation to you. And that can be little, big, whatever. We always think it's got to be this big, huge thing. That's the only thing God cares about. God cares about little stuff, too. And I'll say this, if you're a teenager, God cares about your, little, your, your stuff that maybe adults go, eh, that's not a big deal. It's just because you're emotional or you're a teenager, blah, blah, blah. To, to, to you and to God, to you, to you and to God, it's, it's real, because it's where you're at. You know, we, we, we say to kids, students, um, you know, when, you get in, when you get to the real world, here's what it'll be like. But honestly, for students that are in school, that is their real world. They'll be in the adult world, outside of school later, but that's their real world. I think we need to, to meet them there at that place, because um, it's important to them and, and it's valuable to them. But maybe you're here today and you have a, um, some kind of giant or something in your life. And I would say to you, first of all, 
Pick up your staff and remember what God's done in your life to this point. And then trust him to be with you through whatever it is you're going through. But give it to him. Second thing I would ask or say is um, maybe you're in a season where everything's going great. Man, God's blessing. I could stay on this mountaintop forever. It'd be great. I'd say this, get out your staff. And look at your staff because without God's grace, without God putting you where you're at, you wouldn't be going through the blessings that you're experiencing right now. And maybe you're here this morning and you say, you know what? I can't really say I've got any stories of God's faithfulness because I've not really come to a place of surrendering my life to Jesus Christ and walking in that relationship. And I would say to you, the Bible says that today is the day of salvation. And I would say to you, make today the day that you call out to Jesus Christ. You say, Lord, I want to surrender my life to you. Don't know what that means. Don't know what that looks like really, totally. But God, I want you to take control. I want you to be Lord of my life. I want you to be the one that I'm going after and pursuing. And I know I won't, I'll mess it up. I know I won't do it great all the time. But Lord, I want you. that's you this morning, I would encourage you to do that. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to play that song again, we, the last one we sang. And um, what was the title of that? It was called uh, Great Are You, Lord. So when you look at your staff and you remember, and you remember how great God is. Remember how great it, He's worked in your life. So for those that go by the clock, it's not even 1230 yet. You've got seven minutes before it's 1230. I haven't even been an hour and a half. You haven't even been an hour and a half here. So what do we do? I'm going to ask you to do whether it's at your seat, up here, um, to find a place. So kneel on your, if you want to kneel on your seat, you want to come up here, if you want to sit, that's fine too. I want us to spend a little bit of time remembering, reflecting, and remembering. And then whatever spot you find yourself in, if you're facing a giant, ask God to go before you in that. If you're facing blessing and just incredible stuff in your life right now, give God thanks for that. If you're not giving your life to Jesus Christ, just simply just tell him, Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. I'm asking you to take control of my life. If you specifically want prayer, want some people to pray with you about something, um, you can come up here and we'll have some people be available for that. But let's just end with this song and some prayer time and then I'll pray and dismiss us. And uh, we'll go from there. Oh
praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you lord and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing comforts us, Lord, when we see those notches, Lord, the, the things that, that you've done in our lives, we thank you, God, that we can look back and we can see those things, not to dwell in the past, but to remember so that we can move forward in the future to all that you called us to, God, that no matter what circumstances in front of us, that, Lord, when you have placed your direction and leading on our lives, when we walk in obedience to your word and your Holy Spirit, that, Lord, that you use us to accomplish everything that you have designed for us now on this earth and preparing us for all you have for us for eternity, God. Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, I pray for anyone here that's they got a challenge in front of them. Lord, they're facing that giant or that Red Sea or whatever it may be in their lives. And God, that you would, Lord, you would show up in just a mighty and, and miraculous way, God. Lord, for anyone here that, Lord, has not given their lives to you, God, I pray that, Lord, they would come to that place of realizing, Lord, how much you love them, how much you want them, mm -hmm. and they would surrender their lives to you. Lord, I thank you for mm -hmm. all you're going to continue to do in our lives as we go from here this, this afternoon. Lord, may we go forward and go forth in the anointing and presence of your Holy Spirit and in your grace, Lord, into the mission field that you called us to. Uh, to be used by you, God. I love you. We give you praise, and we give you, we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Go in the grace of God. Have a great day, great week. Say hi to people. If you need someone to pray with you, have someone pray with you. Uh, you are dismissed. Bless you. Thank you. Bless. Yep. Remember your staff. And don't mess with my credit card. <laughs>